Okay. In the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit that they shall be created. Let us pray. O God, who didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us in that same spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Right, today we're going to talk about persistent heresies uh, and focusing on two of the most persistent heresies, uh, Gnosticism and Manichaeism, which are related. And instead of taking them in this order, I'm going to start with Manichaeism. Um, we talked last week a little bit about how St. Augustine uh, was the most prominent Manichae. He, was, he followed the Manichae heresy until he converted. He was a Manichae for about nine years, and he, he wrote about it. Uh, Manichaeism is a dualist heresy. Uh, that is, they're dualists. They believe that there is a good God and an evil God. They believe very strongly that matter uh, was a source of evil and that spirit is a source of good. And so their, their, their religious uh, theme was trying to get away from matter, which involves getting away from bodies. Bodies are evil. Spirits are good. Um, they had a... Uh, that was a solution to the problem of evil, because you could say, well, why, why do we have sin? Why do we have suffering? Well, it's because of the evil God and the evil bodies and evil matter. If we could only get rid of that and, and reach a spiritual realm, we could worship the true God who is the spirit. Um, it, was, it was started by a man named Manny in Persia. Uh, and he lived from 216 to 276. And he tried to do a synthesis of a lot of religions. Uh, he, he took a lot from Buddhism. And Eastern religions, and he combined them with some Jewish beliefs and some Christian beliefs, and he came up with this system uh, uh, that he, he, he and his followers started spreading around the world, and it spread pretty rapidly. It wound up in the East. It went to it went as far as China, uh, and the uh, the Uyghurs, uh, a group of, uh, uh, that are around today in China, uh, they were Manichaean for a thousand years. Uh, and they may still be Manichaean, for all I know. What did you say the name? Uyghurs, U-I-G-H-U-R-S. It's not, not really important. But the point is that Manichaeism spread around the world and, and, and lasted for a long time. It went to the West. If you look at my handout, there's a man named Faustus in the Latin West who wrote about 400. He was a leading Manichae, and, and, and Augustine, St. Augustine had this conversion opposed him. But it spread to the West as well, and there were Manichaean churches in North Africa and in Italy and in Gaul and Spain and, and what's now France. Um, Manny, the, the Manichaeans had a, a kind of a, it's a form of Gnosticism. We'll get into Gnosticism, but it had a, a cosmogony, a, 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 a theory of the universe that involved all of the, the good God and the evil God, and they all had, had servants. Uh, angels, good angels and bad angels, and they had sort of weird names for them, and this elaborate uh, structure of, of how uh, the heavens worked. Reminds you a little bit of uh, Mormons. Yeah, it could be, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. They, uh, unlike Mormons, though, they were very anti-marriage. Uh, um, it was a disaster uh, to them, uh, because that involved getting... Uh, birth was a terrible thing, because it meant somebody was... In, enmeshed in a body, which they viewed as evil. Uh, and so they were very, they, they practiced asceticism. Uh, they were horrified by the tales of the virgin birth. They were horrified by the tales that, that Jesus, who was one of the good spirits, was actually born. They preferred to think of him as a spirit. Uh, they, they, they followed what we've talked about as docetism, that is, that, that the crucifixion didn't, it just appeared to happen. Uh, Jesus really didn't suffer because he didn't have a body because he really wasn't invested in evil. Uh, and and uh, that's, that's the kinds of things they would talk about. Um, but basically, matter is evil, bodies are evil. They divided into groups. Uh, they would call the, 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 the people, the, the, the ordinary people were called the hearers, the he people that are hearing, listening to the, to the sermon, so to speak. And the really people who were really good at it were called the elect. Uh, and to, you, to get into the elect was very difficult. You had to go through all kinds of 
uh, uh, severe, rigorous asceticism to get there. Uh, and that's what they preached. And one of its primary attractive things about it was that it solved the problem of evil. Uh, God and Jesus did not create evil. They had nothing to do with it. It's, it's, in fact, we don't have anything to do with it because we're, we're really spirits. We're trapped in our bodies. It's our bodies that are making us do this stuff, which are under control of the evil God. And we talked about how there is no evil God and evil is not a thing. So this whole thing is based upon a basic philosophical error. We talked about that last week. But nonetheless, they believed it and Augustine believed it. Unless you confuse it, so it was a divide is. Yes, and, but you could say, you know, the concupiscence is, is a result of the devil, and the devil made me do it, and therefore it's not really me. And that's what they would go to. I'll uh, read you a, a passage from St. Augustine's uh, Confessions. And he writes these confessions, he's speaking to God, and this is from Book 5, Section 10. And he talks about the time that he was a manichae and believed this. And he says this, I still thought that it, it is not we who sin." but some other nature that sins within us, our body. It's not, that's not me, that's some other nature that sins. The devil did. Yeah. Devil. It flattered my pride to think that I incurred no guilt. And when I did wrong not to confess it so that you, God, might bring healing to a soul that had sinned against you, I preferred to excuse myself and blame this unknown thing which was in me but was not part of me. The truth, of course, was that it was my own self in my own impiety had divided me against myself. My sin was all the more incurable because I did not think myself a sinner. He believed that evil was a thing that had nothing to do with him and it was causing him to do these bad things and therefore he wasn't responsible for it. He continues on and says, for the same reason I believe that evil too was some similar kind of substance. Now you don't have this, so it's not, not I'm just, I can't give you everything I'm reading. <laughs> copy machines would run out. But, for it's the same reason I believe that evil too was some similar kind of substance, a thing, uh, a shapeless, hideous mass which might be solid, in which case the Manichees called it earth, or it may be fine and rarefied like air. This they imagined as a kind of evil mind filtering through the substance they called earth. And because such little piety as I had compelled me to believe that God, who is good, could not have created an evil nature, I imagined that there were two antagonistic masses, both of which were infinite, yet the God, good and evil. Uh, good, God and evil God. So that's Augustine talking about what it, it, the heresy. Um, <coughs> Augustine uh, converted uh, in 386, his mother prayed for him, St. Monica, but he also, he, as you read, if you read the Confessions, he he came to be aware of this philosophical error that evil has no is not a thing, has no being. And it, it, it enabled him to become Catholic. Um, he wrote books, uh, uh, he wrote 33 books against the Manichaeans. There's this enormous output about how wrong they are, and he, he would debate them. He debated Faustus and other prominent Manichaeans. He converted many Manichaeans in North Africa. Um, and, and so, so that's, and, and this is around the year 400, so it's a little bit after our time, but, but the Manichaean heresy never really went away. It kept cropping up through history. There were Neo-Manichaean movements, the Paulicians in, in, in uh, Turkey, the Bogomils in, uh, in uh, Bulgaria, the Cathari, also known as Albigensians, uh, came up in southern France uh, around the year uh, 1,000, 1,100, 1,200s. Uh, and it's very, very popular. Uh, part of its popularity was driven by the perceived um, laxness or lack of holiness of the Catholic clergy. Uh, they were going around and, you know, living richly and having girlfriends and doing all kinds of things they shouldn't be doing. And they were not setting a good example. And the, the, the Albigensians said, well, you know, we, we can be pure. Cathari means pure. We're, we're, they were Puritans, is what they thought of themselves. And we're doing better and more holy and more reverent than these, these, these Catholics. And besides, we solve the problem of evil. Uh, we don't like bodies, we, we don't like matter, and we don't like the evil God. Well, this causes a problem because they were, they were converting large numbers of people to this belief and it was completely destroying 
the true religion and, and threatening a whole lot of people. Uh, you know, a lot of souls are being lost because of this. And as a result, the, the church took some action. Uh, the Dominican the Dominican order was founded uh, in the early 1200s, uh, St. Dominic. And very, very shortly after founding, the, the, the popes enlisted the Dominican friars to go to southern France and to combat the Albigensian heresy and they preached against it. And one of its great, uh, greatest opponents was St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, a lot of his writings are, are designed to refute the Manichaean heresy, uh, which persisted uh, afterwards. And indeed, the medieval Inquisition was set up, it was first set up uh, to combat this heresy uh, in the 13th century. So there was, it, it continued on, and, and it's always been a struggle between the, the, the church and, and this Manichaeus uh, dualist heresy. Um, I want to turn now to a related heresy, which is Gnosticism. Um, Gnosticism also is a dualist heresy. Indeed, Manichae, the Manichaeans are a form of Gnosticism, in many people would say. Gnosticism really uh, rose very heavily in the, in the second century. Uh, I, I, I gave you several, there are a lot of Gnostic teachers on my handout. I've talked to about a, a couple of them. Basilides, who uh, flourished about 138 AD. Valentinus, who flourished about 150. And there were a lot of others. There were a whole lot of Gnostic teachers and writers who would go around preaching Gnosticism. And what Gnosticism involves, first of all, it's very dualist. It, it too uh, posits the notion that there's, there's this uh, uh, a world of goodness, a god of goodness, and, and various uh, various angels of goodness, and then there's this evil god over here and with evil uh, spirits. And it, it, because Gnosticism has a very complicated uh, th uh, explanation of the world, and it varies depending on which teacher you're, you're running into. I'll just read you one little explanation out of the. Uh, uh, Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church about the, the teaching, the Gnosticism that's taught by Valentinus. And this will give you a flavor of it. This is Valentinus, a Gnostic teacher. The spiritual world, or pleroma, comprises 30 eons emanated by the primal ground of being who form a succession of pairs. The visible world owes its origin to the fall of Sophia, the last of these eons. This fall is variously described, but results in the emergence of her offspring, the Demiurge, or Creator, identified with the God of the Old Testament. The Valentinian myth is intended to explain the human predicament by showing how a divine element has come to be imprisoned in this alien and hostile world, the evil matter. Uh, at the mercy of the Demiurge and his archons, or his devils, the rulers of the planetary spheres, Redemption is affected by another eon, Christ, who unites with the man, Jesus. Christ is different from Jesus. He unites with Jesus, either at his conception or his baptism, to bring mankind the saving knowledge, the gnosis. This is where we get Gnosticism. And on the handout, it talks about gnosis, which means knowledge. To bring mankind the saving knowledge, or gnosis, of its true origin and destiny. This gnosis, this knowledge, however, is given only to the spiritual or pneumatics, that is, the Valentinians themselves, who thought, who through it are destined to return to the pleroma, which is their concept of heaven. Other Christians described as psychics can attain by faith and good works a form of salvation, but only in a lower realm below the pleroma. The rest of mankind, called hylics or material men, are, are material and not spiritual, and they're doomed to eternal perdition. So you can see how complicated this thing is, and if you, can, if you read more, it's got, it's got hierarchies, hierarchies on hierarchies of all these eons and archons and pleromas and things. It hurts my ears. Yeah, it's, 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 when you read it, you say, what is this? This is crazy. Um, but people ate it up, and one of the reasons they ate it up is it's dualist, it explains evil, it can excuse sin, because of course it's these archons and this matter and these bodies that are doing it, not the spirit, which is I'm trying to get to. Uh, and it also had this notion of their secret knowledge. You know, there's really, you can really, if, if you're really good and, and, and follow me enough, I'll give you some of the secret knowledge, you can get to the next level, 
If you do good at that, we'll get to the next level and we'll keep revealing the secret stuff because it's not revealed to everybody, you understand? You know, look out there, the world's in terrible shape, people are suffering and all that, but there's a few people that can get all of this knowledge. They can really be, you know, in with everybody. They can be the, 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 the right stuff. That's very attractive to people. That's been very attractive throughout the centuries. I mean, we can think of all, you know, fraternities, the secret handshakes, you can think of the Masons, mm -hmm. uh, from what I mean, the Scientologists, yeah. you know, pay some money, get to the next level. People like that because they think, maybe these people have the answer because I'm searching for the answer. And these people act like they've got the answer. Why would it be, why, if they didn't, it wouldn't be so expensive. You know? <laughs> 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 but it would sound like Scientology or that. It would be so expensive. For you to know, but not for them to understand. Well, he taught the apostles it, 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 so that they could go and teach people. It, that's an interesting thing because it falls into to Gnosticism. Because one of the things the Gnostics say is, you know those apostles like Peter and Paul and all? They didn't get the real stuff. He, he saved the other real stuff. He gave. He took Thomas aside and told him the real stuff. And uh, if you join my group and pay the right money, we'll give you the real stuff. And those people following Peter and Paul and you know John, they don't know. They're just, yeah, they were. They were, and they didn't know what they were talking about. It's like the supposed gospel of Mary Magdalene or Thomas. I'm going to read you. I, I thought about passing this out, and I decided not to because I didn't want to circulate Gnostic literature. <laughs> <laughs> Let me read to you from one of the Gnostic Gospels. This is the Gospel of Thomas. And, and, and one of the reasons I want to read this is think about this. There are academics, and I'm going to get to them, who assert that, you know, this could have been in the Bible very easy because it's kind of the same stuff as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it was just those, those terrible uh, Catholic bishops, power-hungry people uh, with, the, with Constantine who, who decided to keep it out of the Bible. But once you hear what this is, you think nobody would have put, said this is like Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. It's completely different. And some of this was written centuries after. The timing of it is neat. The timing, we believe, we, you can't tell when they were written exactly, but it, it, it erupted in the 100s and in the 200s. Now, Academics say, who knows? It could have been written right at the beginning. But even if it was written right at the beginning, I, I don't think it was, okay? I, I, I reject that. I think it was originally written 100 years or 200 years or more afterwards. But even if it was right, written right at the beginning, it is completely different from the authentic Gospels. Nobody would say, this is, this, this, the writer of this is with those folks. The writer of this, let me read it to you. saying Thomas didn't write that. Oh, no. Okay. Is this supposed to be the Thomas that we know, or is this a different Thomas? No. Supposed to be, or is. <laughs> well, it depends on how much money you put. Oh. <laughs> 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 you don't read it. You <laughs> Let me read it. This is the Gospel of Thomas, and it was found, by the way, uh, there's a, 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 an archaeological dig at a place called Nag Hammadi in Egypt. In 1945, they found all these jars. And there were, they found 12 codices, 12 big books. And in there were full, fuller copies of these Gnostic texts, pieces of which had been circulating for a long time. And, and the, we knew about them because the fathers had written about them. But it really excited everybody. 1945, Nag Hammadi had dug up the Gnostics had hidden some of this stuff. And they actually found it. Here's, here's one of the books, the Gospel of Thomas. Starts off, these are the secret sayings. The secret sayings, not, you know, not for everybody. That the living Jesus spoke and Didymus Judas Thomas recorded. And he said, Whoever discovers the interpretation of these sayings will not taste death. So if you want to be saved, you've got to get, you know, get in on the secret. See? Uh, all right. It's still going on today. Everything oh. Jesus said, Listen to this. Jesus said, I have cast fire upon the world, and look, I'm guarding it until it blazes. Jesus said, this heaven will pass away and the one above it will pass away. The dead are not alive and the living will not die. During the days when you ate what is dead, you may come alive. When you are in the light, what will you do? On the day when you are one, you became two. But when you become two, what will you do? <laughs> the, disciples, the disciples said to Jesus, we know that you are going to leave us. Who will be our leader? Jesus said to them, no matter where you are, you are to go to James the Just, for whose sake heaven and earth came into being. 
And Jesus said to his disciples, Compare me to something and tell me what I am like. Simon Peter said to him, You are like a just messenger. Matthew said, You are a wise philosopher. Thomas said to him, Teacher, my mouth is utterly unable to say what you are like. <laughs> Jesus said, I am not your teacher because you have drunk, you have become intoxicated from the bubbling spring that I attended. And he took Thomas and withdrew and spoke three sayings to Thomas. And when Thomas came back to his friends, they asked him, what did Jesus say to you? Thomas said to them, if I tell you one of the sayings he spoke to me, you will pick up rocks and stone me and fire will come from the rocks and devour you. Uh, so he's not going to tell him. Not going to tell Peter Paul the secret sayings. And now you can get initiated into this. I can tell you, but then I have to tell you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, Jesus said to them, when you make the two into one, and when you make the inner like the outer, and the outer like the inner, and the upper like the lower, and when you make the male and female into a single one, so that the male would not be male, or the female be female, when you make eyes in place of an eye, a hand in place of a hand, a foot in place of a foot, an image in place of an image, then you will enter the kingdom. Sounds like what's going on today. Jesus said, where there are three deities, they are divine. Where there are two or one, I am with that one. His disciples said, when will you appear to us and when will we see you? Jesus said, when you strip without being ashamed and you take your clothes and put them under your feet like little children and trample them, then you will see the son of the living one and you will not be afraid. And I really like this one because <laughs> feminists, like feminists say the gospel of Thomas is the real thing. Yeah. Well, listen to this. Simon Peter said to them, make Mary leave us for females don't deserve life. Well, Jesus said, look, I will guide her to make her male, so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. For every female who makes herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's how it ends. Oh, oh wow. Wow. Uh, does, uh, we have sex change operations. Yes. Does it, does it make him like, uh, also, like, uh, some uh, cool hippie dude going through the countryside, yes. just making uh, neat sayings, that have nothing to do with it. And I've got good. some stuff on that. This, you can have it, it, it's, 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 it's funny, but when you read this, scholars are publishing articles in newspapers say, oh, these gospels, they could easily have been in the New Testament, but for the bad visions. They constantly didn't keep it in the mouth. <laughs> you know, even if this was written on the same day, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are, you'd say, that doesn't belong with Matthew, Mark, and <laughs> John. It's like, it's like the gospels are, were determined to be inspired by God. And these were thrown out because they were more or less determined to be inspired by somebody else. Well, yeah. Well, not, and, and they were determined to be inspired by God, but, but on a more historical level, putting aside whether they were inspired or not, they were written by people who were Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John who believed, who got it from Jesus and believed this kind of the same thing and believed the message, the gospel message that those evangelists, evangelists were. We're, we're passing on, and the apostles are passing on, is a coherent message that makes, you know, it's miraculous, and it's got, you know, the incarnation and all that is just, it's it, 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 such a mystery, it's very difficult to, to comprehend, but it is coherent. But I'm, I'm talking about the devil working to, <coughs> to confuse people, to get people away from the faith and well, stuff. we're going to get some more, let me read from the Gospel of Philip. Yeah. <laughs> like this. Yeah. <laughs> And this is where we get Jesus is married kind of stuff. Um, I'll read from the middle. There were three who always walked with the Lord. Mary, his mother, and her sister, and Magdalene, the one who was called his companion. His sister and his mother and his companion were each a Mary. As for the wisdom who is called bar the barren, she is the mother of the angels. And the companion of Mary Magdalene loved her more than all the disciples. And blank used to kiss her often on the mouth. The rest of the disciples, they said to him, Why do you love her more than all of us? The Savior answered and said to them, Why do I not love you like her? When a blind man and one who sees are both together in the darkness, they are no different from one another. When the light comes, then he who sees will see the light, and he who is blind will remain in darkness. In other words, this is preaching that Mary Magdalene is the girlfriend of our Lord, is what the Gospel of Philip is all about. Um, what language were these in? Were they uh, Greek, just like the Gospels. But uh, in, in in effect, she was like the most, she was beautiful, but spiritually, like the way she 
where we spent the rest of our life. And well, that's what he, 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 you know, we can put the Catholic Mary Magdalene over here. This is a different Mary Yeah, we have that. <laughs> Let me read about this, though. Um, the academic world took this over, particularly with 1945, and they started writing books. Um, there's a lady named Elaine Pagel. She's a professor at Princeton. There's another one named uh, Karen King. She's a professor at Harvard. And there's Bart uh, uh, Ehrman. He's a professor at U the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. They're all religious, uh, religion professors. They've all gotten fairly wealthy writing books about these things that have kind of been sensationalized. Uh, here's an interview from Elaine Pagels of, uh, of Princeton. She wrote a book about all these things, about how these, and, and suggesting these Gospels should, should never be excluded. Uh, because if they'd only been included, we'd find out that, that uh, you know, Christ is really a left-wing progressive, like, like these people are. Um, but let me read this. This is a, a, an interview back in, uh, I think, 2003, when I first taught this course. The Da Vinci Code was there, and this was a lot of fire. Here we go. If you were Pope, would you reopen the issue of the canon of the New Testament? She says, First time she's Pope. Yeah, yeah, that's the question. And, then, and she asks, I actually think Thomas would be a wonderful contribution. It would have been a much more open canon with that included. But isn't the Tom Co Co Gospel of Thomas heresy? Doesn't it undermine traditional Christian beliefs? I did this research because I wanted to understand how the creed got put together in the fourth century. That happened for lots of important structural reasons and had to do with the organization of the church after the emperor was converted. The emperor wanted a single church with everybody saying the same thing. He couldn't have all these different groups fighting with each other saying, my apostle is better than your apostle. He wanted to define what does a Christian really believe. So he said, let's just sit down and hammer all this out. He invited all the bishops together to a town on the Turkish coast called Nicaea, and he wined and dined them and said, I want you to make a statement everyone can agree on. They didn't all agree, but the ones who didn't left, and the ones who stayed formed what became the Catholic and Apostolic Church. I really love this church, but is it necessary to believe everything in the creed? There was a Christianity for over 300 years before there was a creed, so what is, that is not what makes or breaks the tradition. I'm trying to say there are things beyond belief. Being a Christian involves a lot more than just intellectual exercise or agreeing to set a proposition. Faith is, faith is a matter of committing yourself to what you love, what you hope. It's the story of Jesus, who is a story of divinely given hope after complete despair. Much of this is very mysterious. It's much deeper than a set of beliefs to which we simply say yes or no. Um, isn't there a danger in picking and choosing what you believe? Says that is a question orthodoxy is designed to solve, but it doesn't solve it very well. Um, this is an article that appeared in U.S. Catholic in September 2003. Oh, wonderful. Uh, oh. Uh, so basically, believe whatever you want. Yeah. And, and I, I looked well, in my only, own, no, 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 only if it's left wing. I looked yeah, in my yeah, I looked in my my files <laughs> in 2003. This is Atlanta Journal uh, Constitution oh, yeah. rediscovering the lost gospels. Oh. And it's about, it talks about the Da Vinci Code and Elaine Pagel's book about how these Gnostic Gospels should be included. And it quotes local Catholics, and it names, and I'm not going to name them because they, they hopefully have wised up, but it says, now a lot of non-scholars want to hear what all those voices silenced, silenced by early church councils had to say. Council silence to these people. Okay. It's just part of us. Atlanta's Miss A says she devoured the Da Vinci Code and has read Pagels. She's drawn to both authors because they reinforce her belief that early Christianity encompassed more beliefs than acknowledged. There are many things that are referred to in the early Gospels that were taken out, like belief in reincarnation and astrology, because they were later said to be untrue, said Miss A. Uh, Mr. P, an Atlanta resident for eight years, says reading Pagel's book has exposed him to another side of Jesus. He read about that version of Jesus in the Gospel of Thomas, another silenced account of Jesus' life that Pagels writes about. Jesus doesn't come off as an apo 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 uh, apocalyptic figure, but more as an itinerant charismatic who is encouraging people to go within and find the kingdom within themselves. People who seek out the silenced voice of the early Christian community are not heretics, but people acting squarely in the tradition of the Protestant Reformation, <laughs> says, says a, a local pastor. We don't like people. We don't like people telling us what to believe or what to read. So as soon as these texts were discovered and translated, people chose to read them. Read them. That is the Protestant way. Uh, I could go on and on, uh, but you can see uh, how insidious this is. 
Bart Ehrman is a famous uh, professor of religion at, uh, at UNC Chapel Hill. He's got books called, uh, and he, he, he has these books on, on something called the, the, the Teaching Company's Great Courses. They have all these courses, the college courses, mm -hmm. and, and wonderful, wonderful courses, math and science, and great history courses, and actually some fairly decent Catholic uh, courses. Unfortunately, he does all of the, the videos basically on, on early Christianity. And one of them is called Lost Christianity, it's Christian Scriptures and the Battles Over Authentication. And the whole talk is about how, what, how terrible it was that these, these mm -hmm. Gnostic Gospels got excluded from the canon and how we'd have really different Christianity if they were, they were had been included. And that's, that's true. We probably wouldn't have Christianity at all. Another, another one he says, uh, uh, From Jesus to Constantine, a history of early Christianity. And this follows on the notion that the whole Catholic faith was cooked up by Constantine and the Council of Nicaea to silence all these voices. We think they could only be heard. We had this authentic you know, outpouring of our souls and we'd be able each in our own way to find a Jesus that's comfortable to us. Like yeah. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of Catholics that eat this up. Yeah. Um, when the Da Vinci Code came out, uh, we were coming here but didn't know a lot of Catholics and in, from our former life and there was a Catholic couple that we knew. Uh, they had been Catholic, Catholic lifelong, and in fact, came from very prominent Catholic families going way back. Uh, and we had a little supper one night, and they said, you know, we were laughing about the Da Vinci Code. And they looked at us and said, why are you laughing? <laughs> and we said, it's absurd. He said, oh, no, it's, it's kind of, you know, I, I wish they had told us about this. <laughs> you know, about how Jesus had actually had a wife and had children, and there was one living in France, and the, about the Albino monks. You know, they yeah, the Bible yeah, box. Yeah, you wouldn't even know. Yeah, yeah. And How it's, it's a form of Gnosticism because, because everybody, everybody believes, you know, life doesn't have answers to trouble. And everybody believes that they're, you know, in the Vatican, in the Vatican, they know the secret, but they're not about to tell you about it. And, uh, but they got it there. And, 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 and they're probably albino monks are the ones that are guarding the secret. And if only we could get to that. All the problems in our lives would be solved, and the mysteries would be cleared up, and we would understand how come we're not rich and handsome and, and, and beautiful. But see, that answers a the question they want. Yeah. It tells them that everything can be solved by just one simple thing. That's why. It, it, that's why it's this is so attractive. It's why it's so attractive. Um, is, it, is there a difference between Gnosticism and Manichaeism, really? Or? Manichaeism is a form of Gnosticism. There, there are really dozens, if not hundreds, of slight variations of Gnosticism. The Manichaeans um, took on a life of their own, particularly with these later... Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas talks about refuting the Manichaeans. He uses the word. They are a form of Gnosticism. The Gnostics themselves kind of died out, although the, the ethos of it, the notion about it, is still very much with everybody. And Catholics read the, the, the Da Vinci Code, and I think, I, I, I fear that there may be millions and millions of them who think, oh yeah, this is, this is good, why, you know, why did I tell you about this? This brings us quickly to the uh, papyrus that was recently found, looks like this, oh, crap. That, Jesus, <laughs> that Jesus had a wife, you may have read about this in the news, he's gotten front page uh, uh, treatment, it turns out it's probably a forgery. Uh, it's probably taken from uh, uh, pieces from the uh, Gospel of Thomas and, 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 and forged. Uh, and I'm, I'm sorry it's turned out to be a forgery because I, I, it'd be better to me if it's authentic because it's absurd. It's, it's on the level of these things. That, that is, if it really was from the second century, it's ridiculous. But here's a, here is a professor of religion at Boston College. Boston, not Boston College, Boston University. Say, my take, I don't care if Jesus was married. I don't know if Jesus was married, and I don't care. He's got this long article, and he says things like this. As for the question everyone is asking, was Jesus married? The only correct answer is that we do not know. You know, that's an open issue in, in the Gospels that come down to us. It doesn't say, so maybe he was married, you know. Maybe he was an astronaut. It doesn't say he wasn't an astronaut either. But it's ridiculous to say that we don't know the answer to that, having... The New Testament. It's absurd. He goes down and says, The truth of the matter is we don't know what Jesus looked like. We don't know where he was or what he was doing until he, when he turned 18. And we don't know if he was ever married or divorced. Uh, <laughs> he, he could have gotten married and divorced. <laughs> yeah. 
But maybe that's why he made the pronouncement about marriage as a sacrament. It, you know, he didn't reveal at Cana that he would actually, in fact, you know, divorce man. But, oh, yeah. <laughs> and then he concludes with this: As for me, I don't much care what Jesus thought about marriage. No. <laughs> um, or whether he engaged in it. I think we as a society tend to collapse religion too far readily into bedroom questions as if Jesus came into the world to tell us with whom we should be having sex and how. Of course, this ignores that he said exactly that. <laughs> uh, I'm more interested in what Jesus has to say about wealth and poverty, the rich and poor. And there's plenty in the available record to read and heed if you only have ears to hear. You understand what he said about wealth and policy and poverty? You adopt my political position. Is what he's saying. Uh, but this nonsense is continuing on, and it's it's getting you know in a way it's getting worse. I want to end, and we, we're getting out of time, but I want to end on a positive note. I want to tell you what the what the Catholic opponents of this nonsense had to say. Now, I've passed out uh, this handout, and I've got excerpts from Saint Irenaeus and. Tertullian. And basically they say two things. Irenaeus says, and he wrote, wrote his book against the heresies, he's mainly against the Gnostic heresies. He says, you know something? Uh, the, mess, the Catholic Church is preserving the message. It's preserving the gospel message. The apostles were the ones sent with the message it was entrusted in them by Christ and we were told to go teach all nations and they passed it on to their successors and it's a coherent message and it has a pedigree it comes down to the authentic bearers of the message these Gnostic people they don't they have no part in this they just popped out of nowhere and say oh we've got the secret you can't trust them because the message that came from Jesus Christ given to John and to Peter and Paul uh, and passed on through their successors Irenaeus says, I was taught by, in my youth, I, the Polycarp was an old man in Asia. Polycarp had been directly taught by the Apostle John and others who, who knew our Lord. And Polycarp passed on to me in his old age what he was taught by, directly by the Apostle who got it from Jesus Christ who was God. Uh, and that's how I know and I'm confident of what I'm, I'm teaching here. It's not something that we made up. It's a message that was entrusted to John, it was entrusted to Ignatius and to Polycarp and to me. And that's the message I'm teaching. Similarly, the bishops of Rome, Peter and Paul, they were entrusted the same message and they passed it to the successors. The first page that I've given you is from St. Irenaeus, uh, Adversus Heresis, against the heresies. Um, if you were here for the Apostolic Fathers course in the, in the uh, part of this course in the spring, it, you will, this will be familiar to you. But he says, it's a refutation of the heretics from the fact that in various churches a perpetual succession of bishops was kept up. He says it is within the power of all, therefore, in every church you may wish to see the truth, to contemplate clearly the tradition of the apostles manifested throughout the whole world. And we are in a position to reckon up those who were by the apostles instituted bishops in the churches and to demonstrate the succession of these men to our own time. I won't read this whole thing because we're out of time, but you can... You can take this and, and look at it. And he says, he talks about, it would, you know, we can trace the succession of bishops in all the churches, but all we really need to do is, because of Rome, because of its preeminent position, we can just trace their succession. And if you teach what they are teaching, then you're teaching the authentic deposit of faith, which was delivered by our Lord to the apostles and passed to the successors. And he actually goes through at the end and names them all. Uh, the, the, the bottom paragraph, and he says, in this order and by this succession, the ecclesiastical tradition from the apostle, apostles and the preaching of the truth have come down to us. And this is most abundant proof that there is one and the same vivifying faith which has been preserved in the church from the apostles until now and handed down in truth. Uh, and one of our themes of tradition and G.K. Chesterton saying the Catholic Church is the only thing that acts like a real messenger, that we're refusing to tamper with the message and passing it on. Um, what is the message? On the next page, I've got two excerpts from St. Irenaeus and Tertullian. Uh, they, they sort of sum up the rule of faith, the gospel, they give a summary of the gospel. And, and what they're saying is the Gnostics are teaching all this stuff. What, what we, what we, the, the true faith being handed down is, is and they give a summary of it. And if you read it, it's very clear that it's a precursor to our creeds. 
Uh, it has in there an insistence that, insistence that there's one God, Father Almighty, both of them assert that. They also both assert very strongly that Jesus Christ was God, uh, the, the eternal word, uh, and was man, and was born of Virgin Mary. This is a direct refutation of the assertion that, uh, let me see if I can say it's right, there's an academic assertion out there that the newspapers sort of sell and believe in, the New York Times and all, that the notion that Jesus was divine was not there at the early stages, that he was just this wise and kind creature. Sort yeah. of. And the notion that he was divine only came years later, uh, particularly in, in the Council of Nicaea in 315, Constantine and the bishop said, you know, we can really rev this thing up if we say hey, he's also God. Uh, he's not just smart and nice and kind, he's God. And so the, the notion that Jesus was divine is a late occurrence. Things like what I've given you, St. Irenaeus and Tertullian, directly refute that. These people said the message is that Jesus Christ is God. They were saying it under great persecution around the year 200. It echoes the same thing that St. Ignatius of Antioch, in the, in the spring we talked about St. Ignatius in the year 110, writing his epistles on his way to execution, saying Jesus Christ is God. Uh, from the earliest days, Transfiguration. the earliest days, uh, uh, the, 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 the tradition handed down was that Jesus was divine. Um, in fact, the early tradition is Jesus was so divine it caused people to fall into heresies. If he's God, he can't suffer. Okay, but it, people wouldn't have been saying that if in the early years they thought he's just a he was just a nice kind preacher. They, everybody thought that the teaching was that he's God. I'm putting aside now for right now the faith, the faith we believe Jesus Christ is God. Put that aside as a historical matter. The early Christians believed he was God and taught that he was God. And it's simply false to suggest that, that that teaching is a late occurrence that was stuck in there at, at, at Council of Nicaea in 325 by Constantine and the bishops. If anything, it's the reverse of that. And as we get into the 300s and 400s, we'll see there becomes a big battle about how, exactly how human is Jesus. It's Jesus' humanity that, that is, it becomes a, a big issue, and we'll get into that later. The next thing I have on this handout is Tertullian. Uh, an excerpt from this uh, from his uh, book against the heretics and I'll let you read this I, but what he's saying is the, is the same thing that Ignatius is saying he's saying he's saying these things are being handed down in actual churches that were founded by apostles and the Gnostics don't have any of that they can't claim any of that uh, and in fact, he says, they resort to scriptures. He says, who owns the scriptures? Who brought the scriptures? He says, it's our people brought the scriptures. They own the scriptures, not these Gnostics. And they try to twist these scriptures. They've been handed down and authenticated by these chains. And these are the true interpreters of them. That's that yellow highlight that he says that. Um, and he also says uh, things about Peter. Go to page 292 just because of time. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll skip ahead. He says, he says this, and, and, and Irene says it too. He says, the notion that Jesus took aside Thomas and gave him secret stuff that Thomas was not allowed to share with Peter and Paul and John, the disciple that Jesus loved, is ludicrous on its face. Uh, you know, the notion that, that, that something would keep it secret from these people and that allegedly some apostle over here uh, that they may make up has some secret knowledge that refutes all of this is just crazy talk. And on page 292 he says, Was anything withheld from Peter, who is called the rock on which the church should be built, and who also obtained the keys of the kingdom of heaven, with the power of loosing and binding in heaven and on earth? Or was anything hidden from John, the most beloved disciple of the Lord, he used to lean upon his breast, to whom the Lord alone pointed out Judas as the traitor. Um, but this, by the way, is the earliest extant use of the word of the, of the, the keys, uh, the mention of the keys uh, in, a, in a father uh, uh, as to Peter. Uh, so it's, it's pretty important. The next page, uh, down at the bottom, uh, section 32, says, but if there be any heretics bold enough to claim a foundation during the apostolic age so that they may seem, seem thereby to be derived from the apostles because they existed in the apostles' times, we can say to them, let them produce the original records of their churches. 
Let them unfold the role of their bishops running down in due succession from the beginning so that their bishop may show as his ordainer and predecessor one of the apostles uh, or one of the apostles' disciples. He's saying, Gnostics, you show me that you stem from this line. And of course they can't because they don't. He said, if you claim authority from Jesus Christ, you need to show that your, your bishops are in these lines. And they, they can't. He says, for in this form, the apostolic churches do present their registers, such as the church of Smyrna, which shows Polycarp was appointed there too by John. And the church of Rome, which states that Clement, over here, Clement was ordained by Peter. In the same way, other churches likewise point back to men ordained by, to the episcopate by the apostles, whom they regard as transmitters of the apostolic seed. And he says, uh, in 36, he says, If you're near Italy, you have Rome, whence also our authority is derived close at hand. How happy is that church in which the apostles poured forth all their teaching together with their blood, where Peter endured a passion like, like his Lord's, where Paul won his crown in a death like John's. John the Baptist is beheaded, head, and he's saying Paul is beheaded. This is one of the early references as to how Paul was martyred. Where the apostle John was first plunged unhurt into boiling oil and then banished to an island. That's a re reference to the tradition of John before the Lateran Gate. And there's, there's actually a mass for it that John was in Rome and was put in boiling oil in front of the Lateran Gate and survived miraculously. A lot of people view that as legend, even, even Orthodox traditional Catholics think that's a legend that probably didn't happen. But it's a pious statement. Here it is in Tertullian. What the point he's making is that Peter and Paul and John, if, they, if there was a secret, they were to transmit it. And it wasn't a secret. It's to teach all nations. It's not teach all nations everything but what they really need. And for that, we'll sell. You know, money. Um, you know. Anyway, I want you to have these because these are much uh, an antidote to the poison, I think, of Gnosticism. And I think they refute Gnosticism very well. And uh, the difficulty I have is that the world in general believes it's Gnostic stuff. And when, you know, when a, when a uh, uh, the, the wife of Jesus thing comes out and everybody starts saying, oh yeah, this, the, they're, they're quaking in the Vatican. They're, they're, if you read the news reports, say, oh, this has been a shock to the Vatican. <laughs> well, and, and, and I will look at an analogy. In Nagamati, suppose he opened up one of those jars and pulled out an ancient manuscript and he said, you know, Jesus Christ said to Thomas, uh, my name's not really Jesus Christ, my name is, is, is Kal-El, and my father was Jordel. I was born on the planet Krypton. <laughs> I, I, sent, I was sent to Earth on a spaceship. I landed in Nebraska or Kansas, and the, the people named the, the, the Smallville, and the people named Kent adopted me, raised me, they called me Carl Kent. And I now work at the Daily Planet in Metropolis, and I actually, in my spare time, I live in the Fortress of Solitude up at the North Pole. If it said all of that stuff, these people would be publishing books on it and, 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 and making academic recommendations, and people would be saying, oh, this is going to be a shock to the back. You know, it would, it, it, all of that happened. It's the same thing with these things. It was not a shock to the Vatican. The Vatican has known about this since the time of the early fathers. They have refuted it comprehensively since the time of the early fathers. They own this because they are the heirs and successors to the gospel message which they've been entrusted with and preserved, and therefore it's not a shock to the Vatican. Uh, I wish that more Catholics could know this, because I fear that a lot of them that, you know, eat this up. They read the newspaper. It's got to be true. It's a oh, newspaper. Well, yeah. well, what's amazing is the number of Protestants I run into, and they'll say, well, you've got a catechism, but there's those secret things. So you just you <laughs> worship Mary. They, they really believe that they have, we publish all this stuff, and then we have secret things we don't share. Well, you I, get on I, your knees. I, I tell my Protestant yeah. friends about the sacred monkey. The sacred monkey. So, oh, well, I'll tell you later. <laughs> I mean, but you'll have to be in secret. What did he He died in 226. Anyway, we've gone over. I apologize. Let's close with prayer. Dear Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of death. Amen.